All right, so this issue in psychology called gender bias is fairly straightforward and I've got a very easy sheet for you here. Everything you need to know is actually on the sheet. You don't need to know a single thing more than this. The sheet is in the description box below the video so I suggest that you copy and paste it and have that handy as I'm going through this issue. Now one thing that I just must say is that gender bias it is not about all the studies you've done that have gender bias. You won't get any marks for saying things like Solomon Ash only used women, therefore is gender bias. That is gender bias, but it's not the big issue about gender bias. The big issue, to use the word big issue, about gender bias is that it has serious implications for psychology as a science. OK, so let's get started. OK, so let's get going with the five key terms here, which I suggest you just learn as they are, simply as they are on this sheet, because these may be two markers very easily or even multi-choice. Universality means any underlying factor or behaviour of a human being that we can apply to all human beings, no matter, you know, where they live in the world, what sex they are, what they do for a living. It's universal behaviour for human beings. Gender bias means any theory or study in psychology which does not represent the experience and behaviour of men or women, one of the two. And normally within psychology, it's been women who are not represented. Very good example would be Solomon Ash and those conformity studies with the lines. Androcentrism simply means male centered, where normal behaviour is judged according to a male standard. So female behaviour is therefore thought to be abnormal or inferior by this standard. Alpha bias means those theories in psychology that say there are real and enduring differences, the key word is enduring, between men and women and we cannot ignore them. And these typically tend to undervalue females. And then we have the opposite of that, that's a beta bias. And these are theories that ignore or minimise the differences between the sexes and say, OK, there may be some differences, but we're not going to emphasise them. They are, you know, they are not that important. So you need to learn those terms. And then let's move on to some key points for AO1. Now. If we are going to support, and this is still AO1, alpha bias, then we need to find a theory within psychology that is absolutely alpha bias. And the easiest one to choose would be sociobiological theory in relationships. Now, if you didn't do relationships, you can still use this. It's really easy. Basically, it's an evolutionary theory that says that men are programmed biologically to have sex with multiple partners because that will that is actually going to help to make our species survive, basically. Okay, so the more sex men have with more women, more babies, and therefore human species survives. Whereas females, well, they can only have one baby in every nine months. So it really doesn't help them to have sex with lots of men. It isn't going to help our species survive. Therefore, they are not programmed to be as promiscuous. Okay, promiscuous means that you're having sex with lots of different partners. So that's a basic theory. So this actually has a, a very clear alpha bias because it argues that male behaviour and female behaviours are enduringly different. Okay. Let's look at a beta bias now, which minimises the difference between the sexes. A very good example here would be fight or flight, particularly the early research, which is pretty horrific, actually, and which you mightn't have looked at, but was actually conducted on monkeys. 
the very famous and horrible study by Brady et al., known as Brady's Monkeys, where these monkeys were strapped to these machines and really given electric shocks until they virtually died. It's just horrendous. Now, what they found here, though, is that fight or flight can actually kill you, obviously, long term. And these, these theories and these findings were applied universally okay, to men and to women and to human beings, even though the research was only carried out on non-human animals, because it would have been unethical to do that to human beings. And that's another area, the area of the use of non-human animals in psychology and the ethics concerned with that. So that was a complete you know, sort of example of not looking at male and female differences. And actually supporting that recently, we have found that the fight or flight response is inhibited in females. It's actually inhibited. Why? Because it seems to make females more more likely to befriend other females as a sort of de as a, um as a sort of defense mechanism or like a defense network okay so women are less inclined to do the you know the fight or flight they are they you know they are less inclined to run away and hide or to fight they are more inclined to befriend and that's and so you know therefore it's a sort of inhibition of the fight or flight response. And you need to go back and look at the beginning of your course in biopsych where you actually, um, you know, studied this, okay, fight or flight. And if you studied stress as one of your topics, you will completely understand this, okay? So men are programmed differently in fight or flight, okay? Men are more likely to do the actual original fight and flight, okay? To fight, you know, whatever it is, or to run away. And females are more likely not to have that response, but to go to talk to somebody to defend themselves against that stress by befriending other females, which is often, you know, why females you know, do not have the same stress response as men and do not have those sort of, you know, biological responses and, and the illnesses that men can have in, in um, you know, stress situations like heart attacks and so on. So there's a complete biological difference between men and women, but it was not looked at in the early research. Therefore, we have a beta bias. Androcent androcentrism is actually a consequence of beta bias. Why? Because when we only use men to do our studies with, then obviously any behavior that deviates from our findings will be abnormal. And this can lead to arguing that female behavior is not only abnormal, but is a mental illness even. It's a psychopathology. A very good example of this is something which is known as menstrual syndrome. Okay, premenstrual syndrome, rather. Now, you know, what is this? Well, this is when females have their periods. A few weeks before that, they tend to have a lot of stress in their bodies. And they tend to do things that sometimes seem out of character. And this is a very common thing that females do absolutely biologically have, and it is due to high levels of progesterone. High levels of progesterone are there to line the womb so that the female is ready to have a baby. But it can also make you very hyper, and it can also make you do things that you would not normally do. And therefore, this syndrome has actually been used in courts of law where females will say well my lord I did this nasty deed maybe I harmed my partner or something but I wasn't myself I was having premenstrual syndrome 
and I'm known to have this and my doctor has evidence of it, blah, blah, blah. And with this evidence, I would actually get a lighter sentence. So it is taken very seriously. Okay, but the issue with this is that it is actually social construction. It is arguing that females have a, a biological response to things that is that is actually, you know, being medicalized here as a medical condition. So she would go to the doctor and she would get some drugs to help her not to have this. You know, typically she may be put on the contraceptive pill because the contraceptive pill will, you know, not allow your womb to be lined like that, ready to have a baby. Okay, so you won't get those symptoms. I'm not saying that's a good thing that women should do. I'm just saying that's what might happen. So this is medicalizing female behaviors and emotions. So let's say she has a real issue with her partner and it just so happens that she maybe did something that she may have regretted, but that she was forced to do by things that have made her angry. So we minimize her. You know, we minimize all of her emotions and anger and say, oh, she was just premenstrual. Now, would we do that to men? If a man is angry about something, we can't say, oh, he's just a premenstrual because men don't have periods. So therefore, men don't have that biology. And therefore, men's anger is taken very seriously. And that's the difference, okay? All right, so let's now get some really easy evaluation points. Right, now here I have four AO3 evaluation points. They seem quite, you know, quite short, but no, they're not if you expand on them as I go through them. They are all that you need for a 16 mark question. Why? Because if you have expanded on those AO1s, you will automatically get AO3 there as well. It's very hard in this to have a complete list of AO3s that are only AO3s or AO1s that are only AO1s. Anyway, here's the evaluation. When we have a gender bias in psychology, this can absolutely give us misleading information about female behavior. And actually, it could be used to justify denying women participation in the workplace. Ultimately, it could. You could have people say, well, you know, women can't do this job or that job. A very good example is the army. The army is a really good example of that, where people have argued women can't be on the front line because they may be premenstrual and they may be, you know, firing off all those guns and doing irrational behaviour. That is really true. That is a real factor in, in you know, female, um, you know, when they when they recruit for the army. Certain jobs are denied to women. Not in America. I think in the American army, women are on the front line. You can check that out and see what jobs can women do in the British army. Okay, but there's many, many things that you could justify by saying, no, female biology, female behavior is so different that these jobs are only open to men. Two, and this is a really important thing. In psychology as a whole, you know, psychologists are male. Now, this might sound strange because if you look around your classroom, if you're not in an all-boys school, that is, you will probably find there are more females in your class than boys. Is that right? I bet it is. Because females love psychology. They just enjoy it so much. And sometimes boys have the wrong idea that it's a bit of a girly subject and then they get on the course and find oh my god it's pure science it wasn't what I thought okay so but when it comes to senior level in psychology there are more men at that senior level you look at all the psychologists you've looked at Milgram, Zimbardo, Ash, John Bowlby just go through the list of all the studies you've done and it'll probably be three quarters men minimum. So this means that at this at the senior level of, of you know psychology, female concerns and female issues are minimized and are not reflected in the theories and the um you know research. Okay. In particular, 
when we start our research, and sorry for the um, really big typos here, it says research questions. So research questions are, you think, mm, I'd like to research into this, or I'd like to research into that. But if they're men, they are obviously not going to research into things that are mostly women's concerns. So that's a bias. Now, okay, when we have lab experiments, there is this very strange argument that seems strange, but if you think about it, it's very true. When you go into the lab, women are placed in an unequal relationship with a usual male researcher, because if the researchers are mostly male and they are present in that lab experiment, women automatically feel that they are not equal there. Men have got all the power and they can maybe label them as unreasonable or like irrational. And this can have a real implication for demand. I should have really maybe, you know, mentioned that on the sheet. So you need to write that in. This can make women in a lab experiment more prone to demand than, than males would be. So what is demand? You all know what demand is. Demand is where you want to please the researcher. You think you know what it's all about and you want to behave as normally as you can. Okay, So therefore women are not even acting as they would naturally act. And ultimately, it's not just a gender bias for the women in that, you know, lab experiment. It can affect results. It can affect the reliability of the results. OK, so you need to think about that. If, if the women are feeling more of that demand, now demand is there for everybody. Everybody wants to look good in a you know lab experiment where you know you are in an experiment. Okay, not a field experiment where you don't know you're being looked at. But in a lab experiment where you know you're being studied, men and women want to look good. But here's the argument. Women more so may be, okay, because those experimenters tend to be men. Finally, a positive point. Some researchers, again, very bad typos, guys. I'm so sorry, but I'm sure you can see what it means. Some, res some experimenters or researchers see this issue as a way to encourage reflectivity. Now, reflectivity is a qualitative data analysis point. So you need to go back and you know, look at your notes on that. But just in case you've forgotten, I'll let you know very sort of briefly. It means where you're doing a study where you've used a qualitative method and you have to reflect on why you put, you know, why you put your data into that category or to that category or you created this theme or that theme. OK, because there may have been factors in your life that may have made you bias towards this behaviour goes into that theme and that behaviour is another theme. And you need to reflect on this and you need to publish that, OK, with your study. OK, because when we have the qualitative data, it's not as scientific as the, as the other sort of data, the quantitative data. OK, so this is a good thing. Because when researchers using qualitative data analysis, you know, have to go back and reflect on all those thematic analyses they have done, it will encourage them to think about their own gender bias and to report them. And therefore, psychology can get on top of those biases. OK, well, I hope that was a useful sheet for you. Everything you need to know for 16 marks is here and you need to, you know, you need to actually go back and reflect on your whole A-level course and find those studies again that I've mentioned. Okay, good luck to you all.